Why? Um, so I have a slide about myself, which she basically talked about. So I've written um, Boost Process, and that's where half of the talk comes from. So that's, yeah. Um, so what I'm going to do is take you through, um, well, I would say what's currently being done in, in the realm of system libraries of C++, some of which are standardized, and just look a bit beneath the surface. Um, so why do we want uh, system libraries? Well, we want to write portable C++ applications. Um, we want low or zero overhead since we're in C++. Um, we want thin concepts rather than thick. I'm going to explain that in a minute. Um, and it should be libraries, not frameworks. I mean, there are good C++ frameworks, but uh, those never make it into the standard. Um, so portable, just for the definition. So what I love to do is just write the application directly on the hardware. And that equals zero portability, because you need to rewrite your code every time you change that. So for microcontrollers and, and such things. Um, now, normally you have your operating system in between. And that the idea is, of course, um, as long as you stay on the same operating system, your application just works. I mean, of course, you have processor architecture, but basically that's the idea. Um, and a certain language came up with the concept of putting a virtual machine in between. So as long as you can run this virtual machine on, on every operating system, you can just run your application there. Um, and again, we're using C++, so we don't want the overhead with a virtual machine, so our structure looks sort of like that. So you have your application code, you put a library next to it, and as long as your application talks to the operating system through the library, um, you just need to recompile your code if the library supports the requested operating system, but you still have the possibility through the structure to talk directly to the operating system if you need to do some extension or anything, really, because um, a library like that can't never cover everything, so um, you just want to have that option. Um, so, yeah, your code compiles against different operating systems, and you have extension possibilities. Now, um, I don't think I need to explain who's true bit. Um, so we want to keep to the principle that we only um, pay for things we use. So it's, it's tempting to, to have some background threads or work to abstract things away and have an easy interface. But if that causes, uh, causes overhead when we don't use it, that's, that's a bad thing. And um, with system libraries, we can mostly keep to that. What we're, what's a bit more difficult is if you use things, um, well, so what do you use? You couldn't hand code it any better. That's not necessarily true. Because if you hand code your application directly against uh, the API of a system, you're um, often faster than if we do it in a library because we have different APIs. And so we, we need to find some, some common basis how to do that. OK, so um, the thin versus thick, what I mean by that is if you look at um, streams in an operating system, it's a byte sequence. You have a read and write function and something like a seek and, and that sort of thing. And if you go into C++ and have a stream, you have a byte sequence with formatting local I.O. manipulation that maybe writes to an operating system stream or somewhere into memory. And well, that's a, that's a thick concept because it's a replacement for printf and scanf. And it's not really um, a library where we, where we talk directly to the operating system. We have a thick layer which does a lot of things even if we don't want to, uh, to do those things. So, that's what I would call a thick um, library, especially if considered the standard I.O. I mean, if you have, have a standard I.O. library which is quite thin, and then you have streams in addition, that, that would, would work. And you can't get the handles. So if I open a file stream, I can't access the file handle, or I can't get the, the std out handle from std c out. It's just, well, if I want to do anything else, then what streams offer me, that, that limits me. Well, the last thing while I'm talking about uh, libraries and frameworks is, well, again, we only want to pay for what we, re for what we use. Um, we do not want to enforce a design. So libraries should be more building blocks for your design. Um, and also, if we have libraries like that, they don't conflict with, with each other. So you can try to use Qt and GTK in one application. It's not going to work very well. Um, and we do not want to hide the operating system. Now, to be fair, not every framework does that, but you know. 
Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is Boost Thread, which made it into C++11, um, Boost ACO, which could become standardized as a network in TS, Boost Process, because uh, well, I wrote it, um, and if I'm done too early, I'm going to talk a bit about Boost File System. And now, if it comes to operating system, I'm going to mainly talk about Windows and, and POSIX. And if possible, just the POSIX standard, which well, Linux and, and all sorts of other things implement. Um, yeah, so. All right, so, standard thread. Who here has used um, standard thread? Okay, so virtually everyone. Um, so, yeah, it's basically just an array AI wrapper around operating system threads. Well, that's, that's the idea. You have a, have a way to, to launch and, and join threads. So if you would have asked me in 2010 how I expect um, a thread class in a standard to look, I would have said something like that. Now, by the way, I have line numbers on my slides, um, but they are cut off. And I'm still going to name them for the video, so uh, just don't be confused by that. So you would expect, um, like in line 7, to have a constructor where you pass in a function. And then line 12 to 14, you would have a join. Uh, I would expect to terminate and the detach. And then the implementation would look some, uh, something like that, where you call in line four the, the create thread function, um, which launches the thread. You have a join which waits in line seven for the thread to finish. And you call the terminate thread in line 12. And then if the thread isn't finished in the destructor, you call terminate on it. So, and that's the, the Windows API. Three function calls, again, what I would have expected. And the same on POSIX. So you have line 26, you have pthread create, the pthread join for the joining, and pthread cancel as, as the alternative to terminate. Um, now, if you look at the standard implementation, broadly speaking, it looks like that. We don't have a terminate function, and the destructor calls standard terminate. Now, Standard terminate terminates the thread, all right, but um, not only that one. So, so why do we have a terminate and the standard terminate in the destructor? Well, it's if you look at a code example, it's quite quite clear actually. Um, so, an example we have a, muta a mutex. We start a thread in line three, and then grab the mutex in line five, and then put the thing to sleep for forever. Um, and in line 10, I just wait, so it's sure it, it's grabbed the mutex. Then I terminate the thread and try to grab the mutex in my, in my main thread. Now, the problem is on Windows, I will never reach line 14. I have a deadlock because Windows just kills the thread outright. So it just stops termination, does nothing else, and, and frees the stack. So that means I can't lock the mutex in line 13. If I do the same thing on POSIX with P threads, um, the console will regard line seven as a cancellation point, so here, and will uh, invoke stack unwind, which has the same semantics, is actually the same function as if you throw an exception. So they will invoke the, the destructor of lockguard, 3D mutex, and on POSIX, I would reach line 14. So that means we have different semantics here. So the problem is then, if I have a library which gives me a terminate function, which on one system can cause a deadlock on the other can't, it's really not portable. So because we have different semantics, um, we can't implement a terminate function. And we can't implement a console function either because we wouldn't have that on, on Windows. So um, then we have the array AI structure, so a destructor can't throw, or you know, if you throw in a destructor, it's a terminate. Um, but we require a termination of the thread, so that was the decision. The only way to handle it is by terminating the whole application, and, and you have to make sure to, to join the thread beforehand. And if you still um, say, well, I don't care. I want my terminate function. Well, that's why you have the native handle function here. So um, if you want that, you can just implement that with, well, 15 lines. You inherit standard thread, implement the terminate function, and call it in a destructor. So that's why I think it's an important point of having the whole native handle thing. So you can get access to whatever the operating system does. Now, um, if you look at Boost Thread, it has one, what it now calls extension. Back, I think in, in 2010, it was still just a normal member, uh, part of the library. They have a way to interrupt um, a thread. 
So instead of using pthreads, they implemented on top of that a way to call interrupt on a thread. And if you're then on a cancellation point, as we would be in line, um, in line seven, it throws a boost thread interrupted object. So that gives you consistent semantics on different platforms, but it's not implemented in the operating system, so it's built on top. And that means if I don't use it, because I don't know, I want to implement it differently, I have overhead. So, um, and that's, I mean, I don't know exactly the discussion of the standard committee, but I guess that's why that was rejected. Okay. Um, so since that was easy, um, let's look at Boost ACO. Um, so it's a basic for the current networking TS, provides you ways to have synchronous and asynchronous I.O. and has classes for sockets and serial port and a few extensions where you can do different things. Um, so the basic idea of having asynchronous I.O. Is, is this. If I use synchronous I.O. with threads, so in line two I spawn a thread and launch the, some synchronous operation. Then wait for the thing in line five and output the result. Um, well, the whole thing looks like that. I spawn off the thread and the worker then, all it does is initiate the operation, then wait, then, uh, yeah, and then exit basically. So I have four context switches. I spawn off a thread to essentially do nothing. And that causes overhead and one thread per stream. So that's, that doesn't really scale very well because you know, if I have 100 sockets open, I have 100 threads. Um, so, operating systems provide ways to do that in a better way, namely with asynchronous operations. So, how it works is the, our application initiates some operation, and after a while, our operating system informs us that it's done. Now, if I say the operating system informs us, that can be a poll as well. So, it can also be that I have to ask the operating system, is, is it done, it's not necessarily a callback. Well, that's the principle. So um, that way I don't have the overhead of an extra flat. I, if the operating system gives me the, the possibilities, I can just use it directly. And so an overhead, one thread for as many as I want. Doesn't have to be everyone. And it's a better design for more operations because I just have more requests and more answers. So I don't need to spawn off a, a bunch of threads. So Boost ACO <coughs> promises to do that. Um, but then you look at the code, and it looks a bit differently. Because, um, so in this example, I'm constructing a resolver to look up a name for well, pacificc++.com. Um, and in line nine, I call the async resolve. But if I now, I would not expect the thing to just run. So I don't know where the IO context comes from. Um, but in order to resolve the thing, which is supposedly asynchronous, I need to invoke IOC run. So instead of just um, starting the resolve and giving the future, the, um, the request is only posted after I call run, so as you can see, see on the right, and the notification is then done while, while in the run function, and once it's done, the run function exits, and I get my, my future. So um, yeah, when I first looked at it, it didn't make that much sense to me. Um, okay, so if we're talking about asynchronous I.O. or whatever we want to do asynchronously, what, what sort of things are we talking about from, from an operating system uh, point of view? Well, we have um, descriptors and handles. So we have file descriptors, which, which just is an integer on POSIX. We have stream handles on Windows. And then you can rewrite to them with different functions. Again, you can do seek, but uh, for, for simplicity's sake. Um, and those things can describe, even though they're called a file descriptor, can describe sockets, then file streams, pipes, and serial ports. So um, that's why I don't know, stream handle seems, seems like a better name to me. Um, and if we want to do things like queries and lookups, we need waitables or events. So we have signals on POSIX. And we have event handles on Windows. OK. So um, then let's, let's look how they are, they are handled. Um, so signals are sort of, um, well, old. So you register 
um, a callback, which I do in line, line seven. Um, tell which sort of signal you want to catch, and then you pass in a function which takes an int. But the int is just that one. It just uh, tells you just which, which signal was invoked. Um, and if I wanted to get that into some C++ code, I need a global. So it's, it's static here, but obviously I can't pass information in. I can't pass a pointer to, to the handler in and invoke that. Um, and also, if I register a new signal, the old one gets overwritten which I catch here in line seven in the old stick and invoke in my handler. Now, um, just be, if I would do that, I could get a 6F, so I need to, need to check it's actually set, the old one, but that's another issue. Um, and the, the, the other problem of signals is they interrupt your program execution. So your program stops, you get the signal, while you're in the signal handler, this signal is blocked, um, and once you're out, it can, can be received again. So you shouldn't do any work in the thing, it's just a notification. So it stops the execution, it should just notify, and yeah, it blocks. So, okay, we, we need to take a few into account, but they, are, they do not scale well. So you shouldn't do I.O. with them if you wanna, wanna have a bunch of, of sockets open or something. Okay, now if you look for the same thing on Windows, so we have weightable objects. It can be things like, like process handles, thread handles, events, or queries like, like the one we used. Um, it looks a bit differently. So you can either wait for the object itself with well, wait for single or wait for multiple objects, or you can register a, an event and then you have a callback. Uh, it looks like that. Um, so in line one we have the, the event handler and we just create a dummy event in line three. So it has nothing associated with it, it just has, has a name. And then we connect in um, line six the event to a handler. And unlike the signal, we can actually pass in parameters, so one pointer. And so we pass in the handler itself, pass in the function, and we can invoke a, a, a lambda that way. Um, and then we just set the event just you know, because it's a, um, an example. Um, so that way we can catch things which, which we not wait, would need to wait for asynchronously. Now, um, the execution of the event handler here is differently because Windows might start a thread pool. So you have threads running in the background which invoke your, your handler, which um, means you can actually do something in the handlers. You, you can't do more than just notify someone but it also means if you don't need that, you spawn a bunch of threads in the background. So that's, again, overhead we might not want. Okay, now, um, un, well, not unlike signals, but, but um, we can use events with, with I.O. So um, in line one, I create a file. Now, I should mention, um, Boost ACO doesn't support files. I'm just using that because it's the simplest example, because if I start opening sockets here, that's, that's just more code, so just, um, okay, I hope that makes sense. Um, and we pass in, in line five, the five flag, flag overlapped. And overlap means the IO is overlapped to your program execution. That's what's, what the Windows API calls the thing, um, which is O non block on, on POSIX. Then we construct an overlap structure um, and pass it into the write file function in line 16, so down here. And if we do that, the write file function will not block. So it won't wait until the, the write operation is done. It might, but not necessarily if we write a bunch of data. And after we're through here, we can query the overlapped um, structure with get overlapped result. Or we can previously register an event to the overlapped structure as we did in the, in the last slide. So here, line 11, you saw that before, how, how that can look. So it means the write file doesn't block. We can either query afterwards how the state is looking or we can register an event. Now, um, now it works, but the problem is we would need to register an event per file handle. So that's, doesn't, well, it scales linearly if, if you use a bunch of, of sockets or stream handles. So what you can do instead is you can use IO completion ports. So we do the same thing. We create a file with the overlap flag, flag. We have the overlap structure, and we create an I/O completion port around the, uh, around the file handle. 
And in line five, you can pass in an existing completion port, so you can combine a bunch of file handles into one completion port. Then we initiate our asynchronous operation in line eight with the right file command. And in line 14, we, we query the completion status. Now, here is a timeout. I just put in infinite. You can put in a, a millisecond timeout there. And once the get queued completion status is, is done, the um, overlap pointer we declared here will point to the overlap structure. So that way we know which operation completed. And that means we can, in addition, assign a bit more information to it. So we could do something like that. In line two, we just inherit the overlap structure, put in a member. Then we know here what sort of structure it is and, and have some data. I mean, it's, it's a dummy, but you know you can, can add complete function handlers and that sort of thing. So what means is we can combine a bunch of, um, a bunch of file handlers into one, into one query operation. Okay. Um, so to summarize that, we can use callbacks for events. We could use callback-based async IO per operation, um, but the callback may, may spawn a thread pool. And we can use completion ports for querying and waiting for multiple operations. So in theory, if you use the formal three, we could write something like that in Windows. We don't have the AO context, we have a future, and then it's the Champagne future, and you can use stop then and chain this stuff up if you want to do that. Um, now, but the reason it's not done is because that doesn't work that way on, on uh, POSIX. So, first of all, if you were to Google POSIX asynchronous IO, you find the AIO H library. The problem is, so it's comic based, um, but it only supports file IO in most implementation. It's, it's specified against file descriptors, but in effect, you can't use it with networking stuff. It has a very special application, and the Boost AFU library project uses that. You can look into that if you're interested. Um, the next option would be SIGIO, but the first problem is it's not POSIX, it's just on some POSIX implementation, and then it only supports a subset of streams, um, so stream types, and it brings all the problems of signals. So if I have a bunch of operations, it could block and I could use some, some signals. That makes sense if you write one very specific low-level application, so you have one socket you need to react very fast to and that sort of thing, but it's very specific to that. It's not a solution for a general C++ library. Okay, so basically we can say a POSIX implementation cannot be callback based, so we can't do that. For this reason. Except we build something complex with our own background threads and that sort of thing, but that gets done in the territory of having you know, overhead or at least a, a, a thick concept which hides a lot of its functionality, and that's, I don't think that's what we want in, in the language. Okay, so what can we do? Well, we can use Perl on, on POSIX. So what we do is we set the O non block um, flag on file descriptors. In this case, because I'm too lazy to open a file, we just use the standard streams. We take an array of PolyFD structures and say we want to listen to this file descriptor and this event. So in line six, we say we want to listen if standard in has new data to read. And in line seven and eight, we ask, uh, we, we set to the output that um, we want to know if, if, there's, um, if the stream can, can be written to. Then in line 11 and 12, we write something and then we pull. Paul then returns the number of, of file handles um, that are available in the events. It sets also the events in the, in the array. Um, so after the call, we know, I, don't know, I mean, I don't know what happens, right? We, we know which, which of the file descriptors um, has completed writing. So the other function you always find connected to that is select, which does somewhat the same, is based on um, a file descriptor mask is, is well normally discouraged from usage. So yeah. So what we can do is we combine a bunch of, of file handlers and wait for them all to change state or to, to get in a certain state. Um, now, the select or poll implementations are slow because they check every file descriptor in the list and iterate them and wait for the state to change. 
which is why, um, why a bunch of implementations just have different concepts to do. So ePoll, KQ, and DevPoll are the most other ones also implemented in, in ACO, and they are in the corresponding kernel. So, um, well, they work a bit differently, but, but the, the, the important part is they are faster. And so ACO picks the proper implementation. It's called Reactor. That's, that's the background worker for the I.O. context, um, according to which system you're compiling on. So it's more specialized than just either Windows or POSIX. Now, um, so to summarize that, we can use callbacks as notifications, obviously. We can't use them to put work in them or combine them with a stream, at least not on POSIX. But we can on both poll multiple streams or wait for multiple streams with a, with a uh, well, we can poll with a zero timeout, so it just says what the state is, or we can wait for them. Um, so if you want to have an asynchronous library, it should be based on that, because I can work around that. Right? Um, so the idea is we combine just a bunch of stream handles and descriptors. Now, I say all. Um, basically all you want. You, you, that's why it's called I.O. context. You put all you want in one, and you can have several of those. And then I use either poll or I.O. completion port to get the status of all in them. So we can call a poll or a run function. Run means it waits and, and does work. And then, of course, it, it handles the results if something changed. Um, now, the question is then, if we have that, can we add notification or callback handling? Because now we have a bunch of file descriptors or handles, and we wait for them all. So what do we do next? Well, you can just use um, post-queued completion status on Windows, which just wakes up the I.O. completion port. Or you can use an event file descriptor on POSIX. So you have a, sort of a dummy file descriptor. Um, back in the day, you used just a self-pipe for that which means you write something in, you listen to the output pipe, and then it wakes up the, the poll function. Um, these days you have event FD for exactly that purpose without the overhead. So that means the structure, um, you can um, wake that up, and then you have a notification which says what should be done afterwards. So you interrupt the wait that way from another thread or from some handler. Um, now you can queue work manually with, with IO context post, and so we introduced a new concept, which seems thick, but in my opinion, it's, it's at least for that part, um, the right choice, because you, you abstract away the functionality of waiting for multiple handles and having, uh, therefore, an, an a combination of async operations. Um, now, it has the way little overhead regarding polling. Again, I can't use the event handlers of Windows. Um, but it requires the queuing of operations. And I mean, I didn't look, well, I don't know everything, so I, I don't know if that's the right choice. Um, because you still, um, you still post your first operations here in line 17 before, anything, um, before the run, it doesn't happen until you, you hit the run function. But at least I think um, the, the whole idea of the I.O. context makes sense. So we have, um, and it's going to be, we have the I.O. context, we have a pipe, which are two file descriptors. We combine it into one I.O. context, and then we queue up our operations. So in line 17, we post the write function. The handler for that is in line 10. And once the write is done, we read the data and use, use a future for that, because why not? Um, so yeah, OK, I hope that makes sense. OK. Um, because then we can move on to boost process. Um, and the challenge here is a bit on a, on a different um, point because, so first of all, process, as the name says, allows you to launch processes and then gives you things like pipes and environment to, to interact with them. So the, the challenge is a bit different because if I want to launch a process, I have a bunch of settings I want to put in. So normal stuff you want to do is, is a command and, and arguments. You want to redirect the streams maybe set a working directory and envi the environment. Now, that's why you could say, OK, I have one initialization structure. But then you come to platform extensions, which you might want to have. For example, can be, do you show the window or not on Windows? Or you have additional fi um, file descriptors on, on POSIX you want to use. 
And it also leads you want to have user extensions. And, and the, the idea is that I don't want to hide the um, I don't want to hide the operating system. So if you as a user want to have some extension there, I should give you access to it. And unlike threads, I can't just give you the handle because you want to, you need to do the settings at startup. You can't just um, grab the process when it's running and do the essential settings. So it's a bunch of stuff that's hidden and inaccessible there. So um, given that, Boost process has a very static interface. So you have like a tag. Um, so in line two, the x equals yields an expression, and, and that's the way we set, set the executable. We set the arguments like so, and um, the start directory. And in the second example, we just launch another application and redirect the pipe. <coughs> and by the way, the pipe has a greater than operator, so it feels like a console. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the idea, so the thing is very adic. And then you can add at the end um, user extensions if you want that. Now, um, the problem is the code which is generated by those expressions. Because if I do that, as in line two, that's, that's the first example on Windows, um, well, that looks quite reasonable, actually. You yeah, just invoke the create process, and then you pass forward the, the arguments. As in line four, the first one is the, is the application name. The second one is, um, are the arguments, which you know, is a null-terminated list, which is sort of fun. So well, it's an, a vector separated by, by null terminators. And in line nine, I have a parameter to set the, set the working directory. And then I just ignore the environment and creation flags and all that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, that's how I would launch a process on Windows. That sort of still makes sense. But if I then go on, on POSIX, it becomes fun. Because the way I launch a process on, on POSIX is by forking the current one, which copies it. Now, Got to add, it's sort of a virtual copy, so as long as you don't access the memory, it doesn't copy everything. But um, well, it's not a virtual copy. I'm, I'm just saying it's, it's optimized. So if you if you if you fork a program that occupies 500 megabytes of RAM, it doesn't copy all of that, unless you want to. Um, so fork returns either zero if you're in a child process, minus one if it fails. So we would need to add some error handling. Um, or the PID of the child process if you're in the, the father process. Now, if I want to change the working directory, I got to do that when I'm already in the child process. So that is line line six here. So the the code was executed on the child process. It calls change the on itself. Then it sets up in line seven the arguments and executes the thing. Um, so yeah, that's um, very intuitive. Um, now. Thus far, it still looks reasonable, but when you, when you start adding piping, it becomes a bit more complicated. Now, so we have our pipe, which is declared in line one. We want to direct, direct our, um, our output to. Once we're in the child in line eight, we duplicate the handle of the, of the pipe into the standard out file number. So the, the duplicate, yeah. The, the, the duplicate to function takes in a file descript and basically copies it and overwrites the one I put in the, in the second one. Um, then I close the, the actual pipe, so I only have one file descriptor open, and then I execute the application. And then when I'm at the father process in line 14, um, I'm going to close the sync. So I only have the source open at the father process, the, the um, sync open at the child process. So once the child process goes, um, exits, it's, the pipeline is closed, and I get an ender file. That's, that's the idea. Um, and that's how it looks on Windows. Now, I, don't have, I only have to close the, the native sync after the process is launched, but I have to set a bunch of stuff for the pipe to, to work. So in line two, we've got to set the, the flag for the um, stream handle that it's inheritable. Then I got to tell the startup info that that I want to use that one as standard out. And in line eight, I got to tell it it should use standard handles. So, um, so the question is a bit, for, for this kind of application, how, um, how do I make it, make it extensible? So how can you compose this code? Because I don't want to have a, a large structure of if else clauses. And also, it wouldn't really work for you, because um, how would you fit in user extensions there? So the idea is an implementation with an executor and initializers. 
And just to be clear, I didn't come up with that one. I think it was Jeff Flynn for, for Boost Process 05. But um, the idea is you get your variadic arguments in line one. You construct the executor, which is well, abbreviated in, in line four. And then you have a sequence, so a tuple of um, initializers. And then you have three hooks, if you will, that are invoked. So in line seven, we tell um, all the, the initializers that were on the setup. So whatever you need to do before the process is created, you can do there. Then if it fails, we get the, I should be boost process, get last error. But we get the last error, pass it to the on error handle of every, every handler. And in line 15, it goes into the on success handler. Um, yeah, and that's all, all inline, and because that's a template, so those functions um, look like that. So that means you have the handler, and every handler inherits that one. And if you don't implement one of those functions, it just defaults to that one, uh, you, you overload it in, an, um, in a class that inherits handler. So um, that's how it looks on, on Windows. So again, the on setup. Then it creates a process. If it works, you have the on success handler. If it doesn't work, you have the on error handler. Now, I think having those three functions makes sense. But the problem is, if you come to POSIX, you have a bit more steps. Um, so the challenge was, how do you unify that one? Because what could happen on Linux is, or POSIX, as in line 12 remarked, you could have a fork not working. Secondly, you want to say, OK, the fork worked, but now I'm going to start the, the, um, the exec command, and I'm already in the child process, so that's line 15 on exec setup. On, and then your exec command could go wrong, and that's on line 18. So we have three more of those. Now, because they're not virtual and they're not, they're not equal zero, um, you can just overload them, or you can't. And if, if you don't, well, then they get ignored. Um, so that's the structure. So we share the on setup function. Then it attempts to fork. The child process goes down, tries, calls the on exec setup, and then executes the, the child process. And the child communicates back to the father through a pipe and says it worked or it didn't work. And in this case, it worked. And then you have the unsuccess handler involved. So if it doesn't work, it looks like that. On the left, the fork fails. So we have the on setup. It tries to fork. It doesn't. Then on fork error gets invoked, and then on error gets invoked. On the right side, we have um, the on setup, then the fork works, on exec setup is invoked, um, but then the exec VE fails. So on exec error, it reports to the father process and calls an error. Um, and that looks quite convoluted, but that's the way we can, um, we can share three of those hooks across the, the systems. And we can extend the thing, and so on. So, um, well, that structure, the, the um, start in the initializer looks like that. So on POSIX, I just have the on exec setup, invoke the change dir command there. So that's after the fork. And on Windows, I have access to the executor members. In this case, the work directory, which is normally null. And now I assign it a value. And that way, I can change that. So the executor is documented, and you can access all the members. And thus, you have access to all the settings going into launching a process. Um, right. And an extension would look like that. So you have the handler. If I use that one in well, line four of the lower example, I just have a hello world, essentially. Um, and if that thing now inherits the Windows handler, it uses the on setup of that one and ignores the on success and on error. And the same goes for the POSIX handler. It just ignores the other three, and we can write this code and this extension on, on either platform. So, and then I just pass in an instance of, of the my extension object. Okay, yeah, that's how you launch a, a process. Um, now, in this process, I have a, have a bunch of things where you have to equalize, sort of work around differences on the operating system. Um, and I just picked one of those, and that's the, the async pipe. So, I wanted to be able to use pipes with boost ACO. And so you can construct an IO context. And then you have 
a pipe and an async pipe. And that's different than on Boost ACO because ACO just has, has a socket. It doesn't have an, an async and an async socket. Um, so why is that? Well, you can on POSIX set the own on block on any pipe or any, any stream handle virtually. Um, so you can use all of them with Boost ACO, but you can't use that on Windows. So Windows only supports that on name pipes, which name pipes in that sense are Windows concept as well. So the way that it's done is, if I use a normal pipe on Windows, it just uses a normal pipe. It, it doesn't create a name pipe because it's overhead. So if you use an ASIC pipe, it's always named on Windows. So the way that works is, and that's quite hacky, but I didn't find a better solution. There's a global function um, where it creates a pipe name if you want to do that. So it, as you can see here on line two, you have the name, so the double backslash means it's a hardware component and it's a pipe, and then I have my actual pipe name. Then it depends the PID of the current process, uh, underscore so it doesn't conflict with the name, and then it just counts up a global. Well, that's how that is done. Um, so unless you're using more than two, um, know, more than whatever fits into a size T, you're good. Um, but yeah, that's, that's sort of a workaround there. Um, and that's why you know, those are two classes. Um, now, that brought me to the point that I said, well, now I have named pipes. I mean, even though it's not public yet, and if I just have to pipe an async pipe, but if I can create a named pipe, there should be a public interface for that. So the user should be able to name a pipe explicitly. And POSIX doesn't have a similar concept. Well, it does sort of, but not like that. Because the, the, the Windows name pipes, you can connect from another computer to yours and can make those public. So the dot means it's private. Huh? Um, so th then I went about to create a name pipe for POSIX, which is just done by the make fever command. So that's like a virtual, not a virtual file. It's a, well, it's not a real file. It looks like a file. And you can write to it and directly read to it. it I think it's buffered. And it behaves then if you get two handles to it like a pipe. So that way you can then go about, um, get a pipe name because I don't have facilities for that in, in the library. You can create, create a name pipe with a normal pipe. And coincidentally, that's then also a handle which supports Boost ACO. So you can explicitly construct an async pipe from that one. If name pipe would not be a name pipe, if we wouldn't have the overlapped option, um, this would throw an exception. On Windows, not on, on, on Linux. So you still have a bit of a difference there, but at least it's generic enough, I think, to, yeah, to work. When using fork, how do you deal with all the open file handlers and threads and all of the other issues that come with fork? Yeah, that's the most fun one. That's, we, we had a big discussion about um, the file handlers, that you should introduce a capability of limiting them. And that's, that's sort of a problem which is ambiguous by, by, by design, because you can do something like that, but, but the default behavior is just like you do nothing on either system. Um, and you could introduce some functionality, like, again, just having an explicit list of those file handlers should be inherited, or a, a blacklist of those should not be and should be closed in the child process. So it's implementable as an extension. But using one of those as the default behavior sort of seems a bit fishy to me. Because you know it's it's not what the operating system does if I hand code it. Um, for the um, uh, yeah Linux implementation with uh, fork and exec, did you look at the POSIX spawn APIs, which provide a similar to Windows? The, uh, the which one? POSIX spawn. The POSIX spawn, yeah, but it's I think it has a bunch of other issues. Um, I can't remember them off the top of my head. But, and uh, so it, I think it has some constraints and it essentially uses fork and exec underneath the service anyhow. That's, that's for, for how far I can remember that one, sorry. There was only one sort of question that popped up in my head when I was looking at the uh, closing of the file handle in the create process in Windows. Yeah. Um, why do you even need to close the stood out file handle in that place at all? Create process is a separate process. It's got its own handles. In a child process, you mean? Yeah. Or were you inheriting or passing on the file handle? I didn't quite understand which, that. Which one? Um, there was just one line at the very end after create process that said just 
close the file handle. That one. Yeah, that one. Do you actually need to do that? Yeah, because otherwise I have to pipe open. So I have to pipe open still on the father process. In the parent. In the parent process, yeah. So if I don't close that, if I close that, that means the only other side of the pipe is open in the child process. So once the child process exits, the operating system kills all the handles. And that's when um, the pipe becomes unreadable on the father side. And thus I get an end of file. If I wanted to close it, I could read forever. And then, yeah. I mean, you can have that behavior if you want by just duplicating the pipe beforehand. And then, so binding yeah. to a temporary. <laughs> Hello. Uh, what did you choose for the parallel between standard thread and terminate and a process and killing the process? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I just thought about including that. You have the, what is it, was it kill minus nine, where you just unconditionally terminate a, a child process. So I, the, the child has a terminate, and that's also invoked on the destructor. And the terminate is either terminate process on Windows and kill mi minus nine. The big difference actually is that you have a way, I know at the top of my head, the, the kill version way where the child can respond. So that's like a, a cancel or exit, where you signal the child process it should exit, but it can refuse, or react to it at least, because the kill minus nine just kills it unconditionally. The problem there is there's no equivalent like that on Windows. Because you either, you have two handles on Windows. You either have a, a Windows application, where not the program, but the H window handle of the main window gets signaled, or you have a signal handler which just says uh, control C was entered. And they have a handler to control C, and you can then emulate it that way. But those are two different things with different semantics. So there's no consistent way of, of signaling a Windows process that should exit gracefully. So I was a little bit confused there on uh, Windows with the end of um, thread and terminate yeah. being called there and terminate, actually terminate the application. So is terminate called in the destructor of the thread object, or is that? Yeah, yeah. If, if, you, if you hit the, the thread destructor, of standard thread, yeah. the thread is still running and is attached. Yeah. Your program will terminate completely. Yeah, okay, so at the completion of the, the thread handler function, you know, you do some work, you finish. What happens at the end of that function call and the thread option, yeah, because I've got, you know, we, we have we use threads on our Windows systems, and they're not we're not blowing up the application. They are finishing. What's happening at the end of that thread object when the work function's completed? They're not close handle. You have to wait for the you have to wait for the handle, yep. and then close it. And I've, I'm not sure if the Windows thread is then in an undefined state or something. I've, I've seen that, so I don't know what the standard implementation does there. Because you can also put your thread then to sleep. So it's in a defined state, and you wake it up before you join it afterwards. So I'm, I'm not sure how, how that is done. But normally, you have to wait for the thing, so it's, it's, it's enough waiting for it, and you close the handle. <laughs>